I just uh, I just ate a cough drop really fast, and I think I have a piece stuck in about halfway down my esophagus, so if I start coughing in a second, uh, that's why. <laughs> Hopefully it'll melt and go on down uh, soon. Um, so it's, it's that time of year when you got to box stuff up, right? It's time to package all of that Christmas stuff up. And uh, I don't know about you, I told my wife, I think I told Caitlin, I told somebody, I, I hate packing stuff up at Christmas time. One, it's like Christmas season's over, and I like Christmas, and so it's, you know, kind of, you don't like to put it all up, it's been so much fun. The other part, it's just that I don't like boxing stuff up and packaging and organizing, and I look at the Christmas tree, and I'm like, oh man, I want to get those ornaments off and get them back in the boxes, try to get them packaged so that when we pull them out next year, they're not broken all in pieces, and all that stuff that goes along with it. I don't know. How many of you have, still have your Christmas tree up? Who's got your Christmas tree up? Okay, we're, we're, a small, we're a small number. Ours is still up. But it's only because we, we haven't had time to take it down. That's the only reason. Uh, but uh, um, anyways, it's that, it is that time where we start um, thinking about, all right, what do we put up? Um, and then we'll get ready to pull it out again next year. As we think about that, I think there's something that we need to be careful that we don't box up. Something we need to be careful that we don't put back in some kind of package and stick it back in a corner of the house or under a bed or in the attic or wherever it is you keep your stuff out in the barn. We got to be careful that we don't pack up everything. That we leave, that we leave something out that is of utmost importance. Over the past several weeks, we have looked at a passage in the book of John. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And I hope, I hope that you have learned some things about Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I know, personally, I have learned a lot about Christ. Uh, as we've studied through these first 18 verses of John, what's known as the prologue of John. In verses 1 through 5, if you want to glance back, if you've got your Bibles already open uh, to John chapter 1, you can glance back at verses 1 through 5 and we learn that Jesus is divine, that he is the word that has existed from before time, that he has always existed, he is fully God, and that he's the life and he gives light to men, and, and this light conquers the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. We learn that about Jesus. And then in verses 6 through 13, we, we saw that uh, Jesus' coming presents us with a choice of whether or not we will receive Jesus. And to all who did receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. And then as we moved on from there, we, we saw in verses 14 through 18, uh, last Sunday on Christmas Eve, that this word that is the eternal word, is fully God, took on flesh and entered into our world and shown the glory of God. The glory of God coming into a sinful world, and yet sinners are not consumed by it. And it's because he not only brought the glory of God, but he brought the saving grace of God. And that grace characterized the glory. And so we're able to receive Jesus and live in his presence and see his glory and enjoy it instead of being consumed by it. We're able to be forgiven of our sins. So we, we learn all of that, but, but now what? Now what? How do we respond to this good news of Jesus' first coming? How does all that we've learned about Jesus impact the way that we live our lives? Is this knowledge about Jesus just interesting information for us to package back up with all of our ornaments and decorations, and then we pull it out again next December and say, oh wow, now's the time where we talk again about Jesus. And I remember back last year when I learned that Jesus was fully God, or that he became flesh, or that he's shown the glory of God, or that Christmas presents us with a choice. Or should our lives look different in the coming year as a result of our encounter with Jesus during this Christmas season that we have just experienced? I would say that it's that latter question. 
that we don't package it all up, all of these things that we've learned about Jesus, and then pull them out next year just to impress one another with what we've learned and we can remember from last year. Rather, all that we've learned over the past several weeks should impact our lives on a daily basis. And so what I want us to do is I want us to think about responding to Christmas, responding to Jesus. Respond. How does Jesus' coming change who we are? And we're going to look this morning at, at verses 19 through 28, verses 19 through 28 of John chapter 1. And, and I would say that our first response that we see here in this passage to Christmas is humble submission. Humble submission. We could, we could put it a little bit more wordy, okay? We could say this, that our response is this, that we ought to respond by humbling yourself under the supreme authority of Jesus. Humbling yourself under the supreme authority of Jesus. Jesus. And hopefully we'll see how about verses 19 through 28 leaves us with that right response. So if you will, join me as, as, and follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read these verses of Scripture. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Verse 24. Now when they had been sent from the Pharise- now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him in verse 25, "Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet?" John answered them, "I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie." These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Heavenly Father, as we have read your word, Father, please speak your truth into our hearts over the next few minutes. Father, um, help us to learn things about Jesus, learn things about ourselves. But Father, we don't just want to learn things, but Father, we want to be molded and shaped into the image of Christ. Father, we want to grow in Christ's likeness this morning. And that can only happen, Father, through your Holy Spirit working in us. And so, Father, we ask that you would be at work in our hearts right now, Lord, doing what you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Humble submission. Respond. Respond to Christmas by humbling yourself under the supreme authority of Jesus. Humbling yourself under the supreme authority of Jesus. There's there's three ways in this passage that we see John doing this. And we see John the the apostle who's writing this and giving the account of John the Baptist introducing the ministry of Jesus. Three ways that we humble ourselves under the supreme authority of Jesus. And it begins with this. It begins with this. Know who you are not. Know who you are not. Say it one more time. Know who you are not. I know that may seem like a funny, funny sounding phrase, but when we look at the first few verses here, I think you'll see what, uh, what I'm saying, what I, what I think John, the apostle who's writing this, is saying. Now, we've got this guy named John. Remember, he's not the one writing it. John that John is talking about is John the Baptist. That's what we know him as, John the Baptizer. And, and John the Baptizer, he came and, and he was a unique individual. We learn from some of the other gospel accounts that uh, he dressed a little different than everybody. He uh, ate some interesting foods that people normally didn't eat. And uh, he lived in an interesting place. John wore camel's hair, not the most comfortable kind of clothing, and looked a little different too. He stood out. He ate locusts and wild honey kind of living off the land, so to speak, which makes sense because he 
spent a lot of time out in the wilderness. Now you say, well, why would John, who, by the way, is the cousin of Jesus, uh, why would he be acting this way? Well, John had a very unique calling placed on his life. He had a very unique calling. We'll see that call, what that calling was in just a minute. But, but I'll kind of suffice it for right now, summarize it and say, he was the forerunner of the Messiah. What John was, was an Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. For about 400 years, as someone brought this up uh, Wednesday night in Bible study, for about 400 years, God had been silent. He had been silent. You go, you flip back to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and then there's probably like a little white page, a blank page, and then the page that says the New Testament, and then you got Matthew. That little, little white blank page there was a space of about 400 years where God was silent. He didn't send any prophets. It wasn't because he just for no reason, decided not to do that. It was because he had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and his people killed him, mistreated him, didn't listen to him. And so he said, all right, I've said all I'm going to say. There's going to be 400 years of silence. Now, the Old Testament prophets, a lot of times, they dressed a little different, and they acted a little different. People kind of knew who the prophets were, not just because of they said, thus saith the Lord, but they acted a little different weird okay just they were different they were different and God had called them to be that way so they would stand out so that people would listen to them so you have 400 years of of no prophets and all of a sudden you have this guy dressing in camel's hair eating honey and locusts and living in the wilderness he was an old testament prophet and he stood out and in fact people were flocking to him out in the wilderness and it was something interesting that he was doing he was baptizing people And other gospel accounts tell us that he was baptizing them for the forgiveness of sins. Basically, he was calling people to admit that they were sinners and that they needed to turn from their sin. And that baptism was symbolic of them turning from their sin and being cleansed because, he said, the king is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare yourself. Turn from your sin. And so this is this John here that John is writing about. He's an interesting guy, he's a prophet of the Lord, he has a very unique calling, and people are flocking to him, and he's baptizing. Well, it's caught the attention not just of the commoners who are flocking to him, it's also caught the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. So that's where we picked up in verse 19, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Okay, these, these folks are not coming just saying, hey, how's it going? Who are you? What, what, what are you doing? They're on a mission. They've been sent. And, and their mission is find out who this guy is while all these people are flocking out to the wilderness to him. And what is he doing? And again, we'll see later in this passage, what, by what authority are you out here saying, hey, the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm going to baptize you. You need to turn from your sins. Who's giving you the right to do all this? We're the religious leaders. We haven't given you the right to do this. But notice John's response. They say, who are you? Now, right there, John could have said, I am a prophet of God. I am God's voice after 400 years of silence. That's me. I was prophesied about in the Old Testament as we'll see in just a minute. That's me. I am. I am. I am. But notice what John starts with. He says, who are you? And John says, I am not. It's an interesting way to answer the question, who are you? By saying, I am not. What does he say he isn't? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. This is verse 20. I am not the Christ. The very first thing, the very first thing John wanted to make sure was that they didn't think he was the Christ. John knew his place. He knew who he was not. Who are you? I am not the Christ. Because he knew that's probably what people were thinking. Are you the promised one? Are you the one that God has prophesied about for thousands of years in the Old Testament? Are you this promised Messiah? Is that you? And John immediately says, I am not the Christ. Don't worship me as the Christ. 
Don't call me the Christ. I am not. I am not. Notice the humility. He is not the Christ. But he goes on from there. They ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Well, why would they ask him that question? Are you Elijah? Well, if we flip back to the last book of the Old Testament, the next to the last verse of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 5, we find these words, a prophecy. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, Elijah was a prophet. He was a great prophet. All right, we have a lot of information about him, a lot of information about his ministry in the Old Testament. But at the end of the Old Testament, there's a prophecy. Before that great and awesome day, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. And so they think, well, he's not the Christ. Maybe he's Elijah. Maybe Elijah has come back. Elijah's come. Remember, Elijah never died. He was taken up to heaven. And so maybe God has sent Elijah back. What's, what, what's John's response? I'm not. Do you know how tempting it could have been for John to say, oh, they think I'm Elijah. Well, I know I'm not, but, man, I wonder what would happen if I told them I was. I bet they roll out the red carpet for me. I mean, if they thought that I was Elijah coming back, man, I, I, I'd get whatever I wanted. I'd have special treatment in Jerusalem. There's no hesitation. Are you Elijah? I am not. I am not Elijah. Now, it's interesting, it's interesting that Jesus later does say, that John is, is a type of Elijah who has come back. Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. Well, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it, just so you uh, know I'm telling you the truth. Hopefully you assume that, but I, I'll, I'll read it to you. This is what John, uh, Jesus says about John the Baptist. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John... And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Elijah coming back, Jesus says, really, John is, is the Elijah, even though he's not actually Elijah. He is the new Elijah. He is that prophet from of old. Now, I'm not sure if John was aware of that yet. But he still pushes away from anything that would bring him notoriety and fame. I'm not. I'm not. Don't think about me so highly. But he's not done. They say, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Now, who are they talking about there? Well, if we flip back to the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm going to flip back there. Chapter 18, Deuteronomy Verse 15 and verse 18, we find these words. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. This is Moses speaking. Let me read that again. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Let's skip down to verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. There was a prophecy that a prophet was coming. He was going to be a shepherd for the people of Israel. And so they say, are you the prophet? You're not the Christ. You're not Elijah. Are you the prophet? John says, no, no, no. Think about all of these opportunities that had been placed right before him that he could have grabbed hold of that would brought him notoriety and fame. And he says, no, I am not. I am not. I am not. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who send us. What do you say about yourself? John knew who he was not. And I would just like to bring this up to, to us here in 2017, fixing to be 2018. And I would say this, you and I, we need to know who we are not. You say, well, who am I not? You are not God. You are not God. Jesus is. I am not God. Jesus is. You say, well, Zach, I was, I was hoping for something a little more profound there. Of course I know that I'm not God. Oh, but how often we act like we are. When we don't get our way, 
are selfish with our time, with our abilities, with our resources, when we're unwilling to forgive others, we act like God. At the root, at the root of our sinful heart is pride and arrogance. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they tried to play God. God had said, don't eat of this tree. And they said, I think I'll change that rule. And God said, in that day you'll surely die. And Satan said, oh, you're not really going to die. And now they have a choice. Do they submit to the authority of God? Or do they pretend that they know what is best? That they play God? And they chose to pretend that they were God and do things their own way. And in comes sin and the fall of humanity. Now, I know we don't walk around saying, I'm God, (laughs) I'm God, I'm God. I don't walk around saying that. Sometimes I might as well because that's how I act sometimes. I act like I'm God. I act like I call the, all the shots for my life. And if we're going to humbly submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus, we must remember who we are not. You're not God, so don't try to be. And once we know who we're not, we're then ready to be who we are. We're then ready to be who you are. So our second truth we see this morning is this. Know who you are. Know who you are. We see this in verse 23. They say, who are you? And after John has finished helping them know who he is not, he's then ready to tell them who he is. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. If I flip back to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, I find these words. You would see them too. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. We talked about that last week, that Jesus' coming was the glory of the Lord being revealed. So now John is saying, I am that person prophesied about in the Old Testament. Listen, I know John said, I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. But John really did have an incredible place in the history of salvation, in the history of the world. In fact, Jesus said of John, no one, no one is greater, no one has risen that is greater than John the Baptist. Now, of course, Jesus is not saying that he's greater than him, but he's saying, who else in the history of the world had the privilege of announcing the arrival of the Messiah? Who else had the privilege of doing that? John really did have an incredible place of prominence in God's kingdom, in his plan of salvation. And he was able to fulfill that role only after he remembered who he was not. What if John, what if John had said, you know what, I'm not satisfied with being John the baptizer. I'm not satisfied with being the forerunner of Christ. I want to be greater than that. He never would have been able to fulfill the role that he had. But once he, once he knew who he was not, he was ready to know who he was. And we could summarize it with this phrase. He was an instrument to be used by Jesus for his glory. John was an instrument to be used by Jesus for his glory. And I think we could safely say that every one of us who has trusted Christ and has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are instruments to be used by Jesus for God's glory. You are a chosen instrument of God to be used for his glory by pointing others to Jesus. That's what John did. Now, John had a very unique role. We're not the forerunners of the Messiah, okay? All right, we, we don't have a specific prophecy. There's no prophecy about Zach in the Old Testament. I mean, John, there was a specific prophecy about him. Like I said, he had a place of prominence, but it was still a position of serving Jesus, of pointing others to the glory of Jesus and not trying to steal that glory for himself. Humble submission 
Humble submission begins with realizing who we are not, but then humble submission is honest about who we are. I am a servant of Christ, and you are servants of Jesus. And that takes humility. It takes waking up every day, realizing that you are not living for your glory, but for the glory of God. And we're back to what we said a minute ago. That's hard because of the root of our sin is pride. We want to steal the glory. We want to make much of ourselves. And even as Christians, if we're not careful, we can fall back into that. Where, where we, want, we want the fame. We want the recognition. How could we ever want to steal glory from the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who has existed forever in heaven and then humbled himself coming to earth? And yet, if we're not careful, we will try to do that. So we must remember, we are not God, but we are instruments to be used by God for his glory by pointing others to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. This is, where, this is where Satan gets real tricky with us, okay? Where he gets real deceitful. Remember, he's an angel of light, all right? He doesn't come at, come at us with little red horns and a, and a pitchfork, and he doesn't look like that. If Satan showed up looking like that, we would know who he was, right? We'd say, oh, you're Satan. I'm not listening to you. He doesn't come like that. He disguises himself as an angel of light. And our sin is deceitful. And sometimes even our hearts will trick us into thinking that we were living for the glory of God when really we are living for the glory of ourselves. You say, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to be God, and I know that I'm a servant of Jesus. In fact, I know where my place is of service. I know even in the church where I serve, and I, and I, and I enjoy doing that. And, and so, so I, I know who I'm not. I know who I am. I know what God has called me to do. John knew what God had called him to do. I knew what God had called me to do. I'll put myself in this for a second. I know I'm not able to save anyone, but I know God has called me to be a pastor and, and, to, and to preach the message of his word, the message of the gospel. So I know that. All right, check off point number one, check off point number two. But, but if we're not careful, we'll become arrogant even in our service. And we'll call it service. And we'll call ourselves servants of Jesus. And yet we'll serve with the goal of people seeing us. I could stand up here and, and preach with the goal of people seeing me. And people leave walking away talking about me. That's scary for me to think about. Because you know what I'm doing when I do that? I'm trying to steal glory. I'm trying to steal glory from the one that it belongs to. I'm trying to steal glory from God Most High. And I don't want to steal His glory, but if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, I can fall into that trap. And so we, we need to know who we're not. We need to know who we are. And then we must remind ourselves daily of this truth. Know your unworthiness. Know your unworthiness. Look at, look at the, the rest of this passage in verse 24. So he's told them who, the, who he is. So they come, and they, they've been sent from the Pharisees, verse 25. They ask him, then why are you baptizing? Really what they're asking is, by whose authority are you doing this? You're not the Christ. You're not Elijah. You're not the prophet. And we didn't give you the authority to do this. By what authority are you doing this? By what right? And John could have blasted away right there with his right to baptize using that Old Testament scripture that he just quoted. I mean, he could have said, by what right? By what authority am I doing this? Didn't you just hear what I said? Man, Isaiah prophesied about me. That's me. I've got every right to stand up here. I've got every right to call people to come down into this water and baptize them. Who, who, who are you to question my authority? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He points attention right back to Jesus. They ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. 
But among you stands one you do not know. Now remember, Jesus hadn't revealed himself as the Christ yet, okay? This is before his ministry starts. Among you stands one you do not know. Notice what John says in verse 27. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Notice, you gotta, you got to pay attention to what he's saying. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me. In this day and time, in this day and time, the fact that John was born before Jesus would have given him, in an earthly sense, a superiority over Jesus. And the fact that John's ministry began before Jesus' ministry began would have given him another sense of superiority over Jesus. I was born before Jesus, and I started my ministry before Jesus. In the eyes of the world, that would have put John on a higher level than this man Jesus. Okay, But look at what he says, verse 27, even he who comes after me, Okay, he's, he's saying, even though he comes after me in a worldly sense, he was born after me, his ministry is starting after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Even some of the servants in this day and time would serve their masters in lots of different ways, but the one thing they wouldn't do was untie the shoes on their feet. I mean, that was the lowest of the low. John, who knows he's not Jesus, but does know that he is the forerunner of the Messiah. He knows that Isaiah prophesied about him. He knows he's a servant. But instead of seeking recognition and fame and notoriety for his service, he points right to Jesus. And he says, I am not worthy. Even though Isaiah prophesied about me, I am not worthy. Even though I am the cousin of this man, Jesus. Even though I was born before him. Even though I started my ministry before him. I am not worthy even to untie his sandal. Here's what John is saying. He said, I have been called to this really great role. To this really great position of service. But I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to stand up here and preach the gospel. I'm not worthy to teach a Sunday school class. I'm not worthy to sing in a choir and to sing songs about Jesus. I'm not worthy to keep the nursery. I'm not worthy to set up tables to get ready for a meal in the Family Life Center. I'm not worthy to do any of the things that God calls me to do. Whatever your area of service is, Please don't think that you are worthy of it. Don't think, wow, God sure is lucky to have me serving him in this way. We don't deserve it. We don't. We don't deserve to untie Jesus' sandal. But how often, when we serve, we want people to notice us. John said, don't notice me. Notice Jesus. No, you're unworthy. You and I don't deserve even to serve Jesus, but he graciously allows us to do so. Now, if we can have, if I can have that attitude, even in my service, what glory I could bring to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Zach, what are you saying? And as we respond to Christmas, what are you, what are you saying to us? I'm saying this, that humble submit, submission to Jesus every day changes everything about our lives. It does. Realizing that we are not the lords of our lives helps protect us from selfishness and bitterness and leads us to sacrifice ourselves for the good of others and extend forgiveness quickly whenever we've been wrong. Those are things that we have the opportunity to do or not to do almost on a daily basis. 
And it begins with humbly submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It helps us to be who God has called us to be. Think about it. Husbands, husbands, you will never be able to love your wife as Christ loved the church if you're not daily humbling yourself under the authority of Jesus. Wives, you'll never be able to submit to your husbands if you're not daily submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Parents, specifically fathers, because that's who God calls out specifically, you'll never be able to bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, not provoking them to anger, but instead imitating the love of your heavenly Father if you're not daily humbling yourself and submitting yourself to Jesus. Children, youth, you will not be able to honor and obey your parents and the Lord if you're not daily saying, Jesus, you are my king. I submit to your authority. Church, we'll never be able to shine the light of Christ into our community and into our world, making a difference an eternal difference if we are not daily submitting to the lordship and authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to humble ourselves. It's hard to submit to the authority of Jesus. It is. So do you need some help? I know I do. (laughs) I need lots of help. Think about Jesus. Think long and hard and deeply about Jesus. Really, this passage is about Jesus. It's not primarily about John. It's not primarily about you and me. It's not about the Pharisees. It's not about those that were being baptized by John. This passage is primarily about Jesus. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord for whom a way was prepared. Jesus is the supreme ruler whose sandals we are not even worthy to untie. And yet, here's the thing, and yet, this Jesus, who who we're not worthy to walk up and touch his dirty feet, has stooped down to earth. He took on flesh and he served you and me by dying for your sins and my sins. And it's through that saving gospel which transforms our prideful, arrogant, self-centered hearts and minds and wills. It's through that transformation that we can humbly submit our lives. Verses 1 through 18, lots of beautiful truths about Jesus. Let's not box all that up and stamp Christmas on it or write it with a Sharpie. That's what I do. Put it back up on the shelf in the back and save it till next December. Let's take all that we have learned about Christ and put it into practice by humbly submitting to Jesus on a daily basis. A right understanding of who Jesus is leads to humble submission to the authority of Jesus. If it doesn't, we really haven't understood who we just celebrated at Christmas. What area of your life do you need to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What area of your life? There's improvement in all of it. Maybe you you need to submit to him by trusting in him for salvation. Maybe you've been unwilling to say, Jesus, I need you to save me. That's the first step of submission. And you need to take that, even today. For those of us who have trusted Christ for salvation, is there a place in our lives where we're not humbly submitting to the authority of Jesus? I don't know what that is in your life. I don't, don't. You don't know what that is in my life. But over the next couple of minutes, even as we stand and sing, I, I, want, I want all of us to think about, Jesus, where in my life am I not submitting to your authority? And whatever that is, let's pray this prayer and say, Jesus, help me. In this coming year, help me to 
be submissive to you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Heavenly Father, we've been confronted with the truth of your word. Help us to be obedient. Father, to whatever it is that you call us to do, however it is you call us to respond, help us to humble ourselves, submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.